For Crema Media in Johannesburg, I'm Sane Jamini, political struggle veteran Jackie Seroke. He's in conversation with Polity about his memoir titled Zueletu. So, Mr. Seroke, this memo details a uh, how you grew up in Alexandra under difficult circumstances, if I may say, and your role in the liberation structure. Can you please give us some insights? My life and that of uh, uh, my community or people I lived with are almost the same. Uh, the, the only difference is that it was never properly recorded from a, from a human point of view as a, as a narrative of people who lived uh, under under those circumstances. It is always analyzed from a sociological point of view, people talking about the poverty and so on, but not about the actual life itself of people there. My intention was, was to, to provide that. In my memoir, I, I, I remember my parents, my grandparents, uh, the community I lived with, and I also tried as much as possible to narrate those experiences and and tell uh, the story of human beings around me. I, I, I in particular emphasize the point that politics became you. You did not become a politician. Um, and, and, and the circumstances forced that upon us as, as we grew up because during that period in a community of Alexandria, which was different from what we have now uh, in terms of population sizes, the experience has always been that you would become political, that's one. And, and this is how it happened. First, we lived with almost every other uh, uh, people except for whites in the, in the, in the, in the area. Um, we, we, we had uh, Indian traders in, in, in First Avenue. We lived cheek by jowl with um, the, the, the so-called Kalats. And we lived with each other next to each other's houses, whether you were Zulu or Sotho or or Shona on Debele or Swati or, or Tuana on so we, we just lived next to each other. So we did not know uh, the concept of tribalism except as our background. And those people who lived there became um, urban dwellers who had aspirations almost like as, uh, 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 that of people we saw uh, next to us, particularly the, the white community. We, we established values like liking decent clothes, new houses, new, new things that we saw in the shops and so on. So we were exposed uh, to the modern world, uh, which is different from people who, who come from the rural areas. And this is, this is the experience I try as much as possible to portray because that kind of narrative of the urban born hasn't been highlighted as, as much as, 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 you, as it should be. We people of Alex of the time, even today, because we have grown up into uh, uh, generations in the urban area and have gone to influence areas, uh, township areas around Gauteng, we regard ourselves as, as another, if you like, another tribe. We do that because we do not have affinity with, with, with the, the, the rural areas. I, I think it's a, it's a field of study, but my contribution is talk about the human beings there and how it influenced my politics. And would you mind briefly explaining the title of this book, Zuelet? The title really comes from, a, a, and it's a symbol of the, the ambivalence and transformation that individuals had growing up in Alex. I myself, when I first joined the politics as a young man, and there was a lot of harassment of activists. So my friends around me, decided to call me Zuelete because I always spoke about our land uh, when I took up a platform. And in the book, you speak about your grandmother, Messina. You were very close to her growing up and she also instilled valuable lessons to you. Can you tell us about Messina? Yes, um, Messina was the el in her family. She was uh, the eldest child. I think her parents had six children and she was the eldest as a woman. But because yeah. she was the eldest, she was given responsibility like the eldest child to, to look after her siblings mm. and to be entrusted with issues of leadership. She did that um, extremely well from the narrative I had from others and from herself as well, in the sense that um, uh, she, she, she kept the Soroka family up and about. Uh, and she, she, she led even the struggles in her area in the Northwest in Rustenburg 
on when, when people were shunted up on, on the issue of land and she was regarded as a leader. She participated in the march to Pretoria uh, for the women's march, the historical women's march to Pretoria led by Lillian Goy. She was a disciplinarian. She instilled the need for us to, as, as Christians, to attend church and to understand the concept of Christianity and how it applies to ourselves and our family. Well, my family could not afford to take me to a church, for instance. Mm. And the grandmothers played a role. I mean, it's not only her around, it's, they played a role in uh, looking after their grandchildren mm. until they, were, they, they had to go to a school going age. But when it comes to me, compared to my, my, my siblings now, she politicized me. Uh, at that young age, and told me about the songs, they actually uh, told me about the color bar issues, and so on. Well, obviously, as a youngster, I didn't understand because, uh, uh, but she was teaching me that. And I came to realize afterwards, when, I, when I, I was confronted with apartheid South Africa, that, oh, these are the things I learned from home. Um, and, and, and these are the, the, the things that are going to um, uh, be part of my life. And I think her, her, her lessons, including uh, her interest in reading, her interest in al- analyzing characters of people. She was very good at that. Um, and, and all that. I tried to, uh, to understand what it means to me, both as a person and as a writer, because it's important as a writer to, to have, to have um, observation skills of your surroundings, of people around you, what they say and wh- what it means. So, so, so when I took interest in literature, I, 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 I say, it's, it's entirely her influence. Mm. And talking about being politicized at a young age, can you briefly tell us about your involvement in politics at school? I remember even your peers were surprised when you were like in the forefront of what was happening. I like working in the background. I've never really wanted to be in, in, in the forefront of anything. Mm. Um, so in our class in school, uh, when we discussed historical circumstances or had debates, I could be able to make my own inputs, which were not, not necessarily political, but I could be able to argue. But I never really went to the open debating societies. And there, were, there were people who were better than me, uh, who, 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 who led those, di- those discussions, including uh, recruiting some of us to be part of the um, South African student movement was working in the high school. It was a black consciousness movement. I didn't. I, I really didn't take interest in, in, in that as a politician. I mean, I knew that um, it was important for me to focus on education, try to get qualification, and help my family to get out of the doldrums. Then I never thought politics was something I, I was interested in. When the uprisings of 1976 came about in that background, I felt compelled because some of our leaders were, were being detained, were, were being taken off, uh, some went to exile, and so on it became quite clear that those of us who were still there had to take uh, action. So I went in through politics through that. There was a a vacuum, and there's no vacuum that should be left like that forever. So I I, I came in to fill the gaps, and I found that I gained respect of most of my my peers. I gained respect of most of the people I I, I was involved in. We became relevant to the situation um, of, 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 of oppression at the high school level. My teachers were themselves political. One of our teachers, the principal, was a former PAC member uh, and a leader, really, because as a teacher, he had, he had been arrested with some of the now prominent people in South Africa. Like one of them was a retired judge, the Khamu Senek, and, and so on. So the same values that he had spread to those people, that generation, were spread to us as well. And in July 1979, you were also arrested by the special branch. You were in possession and you were distributing uh, the Freedom Charter, which was banned at the time. Can you tell us about that ordeal? From 1960 uh, or the middle 60s up to 1976, the atmosphere in South Africa was terribly bad. The freedom of expression was not allowed. There was heavy censorship. So information about our past, particularly written information, was not available. And we realized this. So uh, in my pursuit for knowledge, the Freedom Charter was one of the important documents in our history of struggle. I made copies of it. I, I actually wrote it longhand from a, from a book and made copies of it uh, to, to, to people around me who were in the block to say, 
let's understand this so that we can decide whether we like it or not, or debate it, discuss it, and take a position on the freedom chart. Uh, little did I know then that um, I, I, I was provoking interest from the uh, security branch, police. They actually found it in my, in my house in, when they always came to confiscate documents and so on without charging me when they uh, uh, made these raids. Um, but because I was RPT and, and argued a lot, they then uh, took it out in 1979 to charge me. Uh, uh, formally into in, into a, into a court case, but one of the main reasons then was that the students, after the banning of black consciousness organizations, the, the young people in particular were beginning to say, "But why don't we link up with um, old liberation movements like uh, the African National Congress uh, and the, uh, the Pan Africanist Congress and others, including the Black Consciousness Movement itself, on how?" are we going to carry on forward? There was an interest in the armed struggle and, and basically to understand what the ultimate needs of our band leaders who were in prison and in exile or were not accessible to the masses were thinking. So looking at the, at the Freedom Charter at that time was, was more an informative drive than anything else. What would you say about the situation in our country as a person who has fought for, for liberation? I take it in phases. The phase of my development up to 1994, I think was, um, was, was, was very important and it was heroic in itself because um, in the ultimate end, the apartheid was destroyed. It came to an end. It brought a, a, about a, a human rights culture with the... Um, basic rights, basic freedoms being given to people. I think that, 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 that was very important. Mm -hmm. But the new phase of, of reconstruction, of developing a country is, is more heavier and challenging than the phase of destroying apartheid. Because we have to join the community of nations, we, we, we have to be charged with economic growth, we have to deal with them, uh, the tensions of how we live in South Africa from, from a historical background, we have to deal with them ourselves as a people and identify the nation that we say we are. We have to deal with the management of um, uh, administration in our communities uh, through local government. And we, we, we all have to do this with uh, minimum standards that are expected of us. Mm -hmm. Now, an oppressed people um, generally uh, have deficiencies. Um, they, 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 they don't, for instance, understand the culture of money, they don't understand the culture of, there's no civic education that has been provided to most people. So when I look at current South Africa and how we deal with this problem, we've had the most strikes and uprisings in the streets uh, since 1994. People always complained about service delivery, they complain about uh, internal problems with their leaders in these organizations, they complain about um, almost everything, uh, in, including the high cost of living uh, mm -hmm. and, and the, the problems that were expressed fully through Marikana, where people demanded decent wages on par with international standards for miners, and they were killed, shot and killed. Um, uh, we, we, we have problems with our, um, our, our leaders in the local government. Some of them have very scanty or no education at all and cannot uh, uh, be able to understand uh, basic responsibilities expected of them as counselors. And I dare say that some of them do not even understand the critical issue of um, a budget. All of this is because people were not adequately prepared. Our constituencies, mm -hmm. are, are our constituency now in South Africa compared to white, white people, um, uh, is still a, a, a little backwards in the sense that they, they, they are unable to call for account and, and responsibility from their, from their leaders. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are unable to deal with the transparency that's necessary when you give people a, a, a mandate and that they must account back to you. Because they don't, they don't understand how that works. When, when you look at the, the local government 2021 that we come from recently, the turnout of whites at the, at the polling booth, is, is pretty fair and, and it has gone on well. Whereas in the other areas, when mm -hmm. people feel they are, um, are 
are chanted with the way in which government uh, uh, is dealing with them. They, they decide to sit at home and, and not take any interest at all. So this, this, these are, for me, elements that show that whilst we have gone into a different phase, there are still mm-hmm. challenges in our, in our social, and, and these are challenges that come from, from, from our past, and we've been unable to deal with them adequately. And you also speak in your book, uh, Mr. Soroke, about your love for art, and especially at Raven Press. Can you tell us how you use that to still push your underground work uh, for the PAC? I mean, to enjoy literature and art is um, it's, it's very important. And I think people do that from, from different angles. But I, I took to uh, lit- literary uh, matters uh, very seriously. I mean, reading books almost all the time. And most of my friends were artists, intellectuals, and so on. And that sort of lifestyle, the literati type of lifestyle, mm-hmm. uh, became part of me. I realized that with literature, it, it gives the imag- imagination a, a, an opportunity to grow, to understand the human condition, and to, and, and to understand yourself, uh, uh, basically, because that, that's how it is. Even though literature also gives you, the, the, when I say to understand the human condition, it gives you the, 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 the opportunity to learn and understand people who are not in circumstances like yours. From the Raven Press days, I, I've, I've grown in leaps and bounds. And I think the education that I received from my colleagues and my friends for, during that period mm-hmm. um, is greater than the ones I get from formal education. And I think that it's very important that we have a right attitude towards education because education is not necessarily uh, the four walls of a classroom or a lecture room. Mm-hmm. We, we, we can learn from each other. And lastly, what are you hoping uh, readers will take away from your book? I have attempted in this memoir to, to use what the Japanese call autofiction, an autobiography mixed with, uh, with, with fiction. And fiction is not necessarily fantasy. It, it makes our realities much more understandable because you get the atmosphere and all that and all that. So I'm, I'm, I'm in my memoir, I'm trying to give my own experience the sociological experience of the situation where I come from yes. and, and, and my way of putting it as part of the greater understanding of human society. And I think that if readers tackle it from that angle, including criticizing what I say, because some of the things I, I do are unconventional, uh, are, are, are from a creative point of view. I don't mm-hmm. say the story in a linear way. I say the story as we speak. You know, when people speak, they can just jump to another subject and come back to the story again. I do that, those type of things. It is all meant for people to enjoy the literature. There was Jackie Seroke in conversation with Polity about his memoir titled Zueletu.